old-fashioned painting, Chalk heeded what I call Reinhardt's The Art of No. No texture, no brushwork or calligraphy, no colors, no easel or power, no object, no subject, no matter. With the subject of big nude being well, a big nude, Chuck realized that while the experiment was worthwhile, it failed to achieve the cool asceticism Reinhardt advocated because of what he called its hot spots. I mean, Cesarean Scar and all, his modern day Ottawa's is hot. Viewers tended to focus on the body parts that were charged with erotic meaning. He wanted to create an image whose, quote, kneecap was just as important as the face. Then he noticed that the viewers tended to congregate around her nipples and largely ignore her knees. So I decided, he said, just do the head. Completed in 1968, it is the inversion of his artistic surrogate father, the Kunin, purged of the rich colors painted in dram dramatic sweeps of the arm, big self-portrait is painted in washes of gray and black. From painting vigorously with paintbrushes as if one were Marlon Brando, Whale, and Stella, all that could be heard was a regular puff of paint from an airbrush for four months. Big self-portrait has been described as follows. Head back, jaw thrusting. He stares out through heavy framed specks. A shirtless, travel haired rebel, fag clenched in tenacious mouth. It's a disquieting inventory of grain and core, bristle and crease. Also referred to as the arrogant billboard sized mugshot of a gangster, Chuck protested, claiming that anyone who has seen Humphrey Bogart, James Dean, or Jean Paul Del Mondo with a cigarette should know that what he was channeling was not the criminal, but the cool. Let's revisit his statement. I don't want the viewer to recognize Castro and think he understood his work. Castro's face, like Che Guevara's or Mao Zedong's, is not just recognizable, but iconic of a political stance. For big self-portrait, the subject was a human head, but not necessarily whose head it was, much less its iconographic value. Perhaps the nearest ideological symbolism that could be read in it in the context of its time was as an expression of a counterculture, of draft dodging, and would stop. Understanding Chuck's work does not reside alone in recognizing eyes, lips, hair, or life reflected in eyeglasses, but in looking closely at how the image is made or built. Ultimately, the subject is painting itself. While it might seem as if doing nothing but heads shows little range, his body of work proves otherwise. How he has created this, these images shows incredible range and a propensity for innovation. Although many of his subjects have since then become titans of the art world, he initially put a premium on his subject's anonymity and neutrality of expression. That idealized portraiture was not his goal, was key to how he had explicit instructions for how his sitters were to pose for the photographs, head on, sometimes lips slightly apart, but not into a smile. The 1969 Joe is one of the rare exceptions. His artist friend, Joe Zucker, upon being asked by Chuck to stop by his studio to get a photograph, arrived in disguise. Joe had slicked his hair back and put on a white shirt and tie. Chuck identified Joe as the only subject ever to completely alter his appearance for a Chuck Wolf's portrait. This photograph shows what Joe really looked like then not the, quote, quintessential car salesman that he intentionally posed as for the painting. This next photograph was given to me by the Japanese museum that now owns the painting. It features Yasumasa Morimura, the Cindy Sherman of Japan. Here, he's standing undisguised as himself next to Joe, which he picked as the most beautiful in the collection of the Osaka Museum. This is, particularly this is a particularly interesting juxtaposition because it is not Morimura, but Joe Zucker in a painting who is disguised with a fictional persona. In this studio shot, Chuck is flanked to the right by the 1970 ball. The subject is the theater designer, Robert Israel. Chuck recalled while working on his painting that a highlight in one eye was too bright. He said to himself, damn it, now I'm going to have to take his glasses off to fix it. When he realized what he had said, stunned at his own response to the hyperrealism of the flat image he himself was creating, he pivoted on his heels and walked out of the studio. Chuck also made his only film in 1970, Slow Pan for Bob. This film, 
This film is key to understanding his paintings, as it is the extremely slow and extremely close-up pan of Robert Israel's face, the filmic analog to how Chuck reads the photograph, intently from left to right, top to bottom, as well as how he transcribes every square inch of visual data, grid square by grid square, onto a canvas. This print is actually in the collection of uh, Ludwig Museum in Aachen. So, so the Europeans actually know this work by Chuck more than the Americans do. Even as his earliest paintings were referred to by a critic as heads of a race of giants preserved in slabs of glacial ice, his first eight black and white paintings were so stunning that every single one ended up in a major museum. He could have kept cranking them out and he would not have had a shortage of both public and private collections eager to purchase them. Given that the how of painting is critical to him as an artist, he always needed to switch gears and directions. Taking on his next subject, the artist Kent Floater, he decided he would reintroduce color in his canvas, but still without the use of paintbrushes or a palette on which to mix colors. And this time, instead of using only varying intensities of black, he would use all the primary colors and avoid black. He first made studies on paper using colored pencil, showing he had, how he achieved the right colors by filling out the face in three layers of red, blue, and yellow. To create the painting, he basically deconstructs the original photograph into separation of heads and then reconstructs them, much like photomechanical printing would by first painting in magenta, then painting in cyan and yellow, similar to CMYK printing, except he left out the black K for key. Using watered down acrylic or watercolor, he essentially painted each of these color continuous tone paintings three times, taking as many as 14 to 16 months to complete each. Here are other examples. It was also during this time of painting large canvases in color that he made his first major print, Keith Metzitent, a landmark piece in Chuck's body of work, not only for its unusually large size for Metzitent or for being one of the rare contemporary examples of a technique that has been out of favor for a century, but also for its visible grid lines that influenced the artist's decision to foreground the grid in almost all of his subsequent drawings, prints, and paintings. Besides diverting his path from working on black and white paintings by beginning to paint in color, Chuck also decided to work in the opposite direction as Metzitin demands, beginning with a dark ground to work toward light areas. Working for the first time with master printer Captain Brown in San Francisco, they basically had to learn how to create one. The size of the print Chuck wanted required ordering an industrial copper plate brand new press, custom made to accommodate the plate had to be ordered. There were so many glitches proofing that the final edition was just 10, each of which is now nearly as valuable as one of closest paintings. The production of Keith Metzitin was so fraught with difficulty, so ambitious, and so miraculous in its result, a work in our enormously rich in tone and shocking in its dimensionality, that this was the first contemporary print to be given its own exhibition at MoMA in 1973. Keith is not a seamless image. Because the plate wore down too easily, it revealed a composition of grid at the center of the face, where most of the proofing was done. Ever the optimist, who finds virtue in mistakes or accidents, he turned this seeming weakness into a strength that enriched his artistic output. Not only did he begin to expose the grid in his paintings that had previously been hidden, it led to a lot of experimentation in how he could optimize the potential of each grid unit, which in turn led him to the conviction that in order to arrive at innovative shapes, he had to invent the means of creating those shapes. This development, so much a signature of Pose's work today, might not have come about had he not explored resuscitating a practically dead technique that in testing the limits of the medium broke those limits. Within a year from creating Keith Metzitin, he made self-portrait 58,424. The number in the title was derived from the number of barely perceptible 
grid squares that compose the drawing. Within the pencil lines of each square were minuscule dots in varying degrees of gray. He created a good number of works on paper, experimenting with a grid that he called dot drawings, including one with 104,072 grid units. Remember the artificiality he was referring to? He wanted to illustrate that eyes, hair, skin, and even eyeglasses for the pattern in the shirt could in fact be rendered with the exact same mark, with mere dots from puffs of the airbrush. He said, these paintings were just clusters of these marks that stacked up to build a situation that reads like something. The pictorial syntax and vocabulary is really dumb. There can't be a dumber art mark than this, a dot. It's a deliberate renunciation of the drama of abstract expressionism. I wanted the stupidest, dumbest, most inarticulate art mark you could have. Just the dot, spray it on. On his way to his first dot drawing exhibition in New York, he came upon something that dismayed him. He recounts. I was walking up Madison Avenue and walked by a magazine stand, and hanging there was a copy of Scientific American. On its cover was a digital image of George Washington that had been made on a computer. I was nearly knocked off my feet. I thought, oh my god, nobody's going to believe that I made those dot pieces without knowing that this technology existed, or in fact, that I didn't use some of it to make my pictures. I bought the magazine and took it to the gallery, reading it and poring over the illustrations. He remembers thinking that there had to be some connection between the kind of averaging of information that the computer did and the way that he digested information and made marks and grid squares to represent it. While close sense some kind of connection between his work and the Scientific American cover, he said, I quickly realized I wasn't interested in having the machine do the work for me or in having any kind of artificial layer between the image and me. I can be capricious and arbitrary, and so far, a machine can't. A machine doesn't get tired of doing it only one and only one way. Rather than be discouraged by the newly discovered capacity of a computer to create images, he went about exploring the many ways his own arbitrary system of averaging could produce images. Chuck optimized the grid unit as it allowed for what he called the incremental unit of the work and the possibilities inside each square beyond simple transcription. Known for recycling photographs, such as that of the musician Philip Glass, he said that a single photograph of a human face is to him like a deep well to which you can return again and again, and each time get a bucket full of different information from it. Let's rewind a little. In 1964, Chuck got a Fulbright scholarship to study the works of Gustav Klimt in Vienna. His fellow Fulbrighters at the time were peers from the Yale MFA program he just completed. Traveling through Europe, he would meet up with them in different places. Here he is with Nancy Graves, Richard Serra, and Stephen Posen at Donatello's tomb. Through Serra, Chuck met Philip Glass, considered one of the most influential American composers, who was at the time Serra's studio assistant. The 1969 photograph of Philip Glass's face has served as a very deep well that gave Chuck almost 200 buckets of different artworks, with the most well-known one being a painting completed the same year. In 2004, Philip Glass returned the favor by creating a musical portrait of Chuck, to which a ballet was set. but he wasn't. He was just investigating the process. My real connection to music was also based on process. The outside and the inside were the same. The activity of making art was the art. The structure wasn't an empty container that you fill up with content. The container was the content. We were trying to collapse the idea of form and content into one perception. And Chuck responded, while I was painting with one color of paint, Philip Glass was making music with six notes. It was a very similar attitude about merging and reducing and getting rid of things. He was getting rid of virtuoso musicianship, and I was getting rid of virtuoso craftsmanship. Glass has noted that his face was to Chuck, what the haystack was to Monet, or the bottle to Morani. Let's look at just a handful of examples of the ways the how of the painting is the subject matter rather than the who. Chuck has created more than 100 iterations of Phil's face from the same photograph, from rendering it in cross hatches to, uh, 
fingerprints. The fingerprints on a sheet of paper with daisy watermarks. This one expresses his love for his, for his friend, the late conceptual artist Solowit, who was one of the biggest collectors of Philip Glass's compositions and to whom Chuck gave this drawing. This one is paper pulp. And most recently, in 2014, as a copper plate etching, using only a single engraved line emanating in a concentric spiral from the center of Philip Glass's nose, inspired by a print made by the French painter and engraver Claude Menat in 1649. The Sudarium, or Veil of Saint Veronica by Menat, this is perfect, it's almost holy week, is based on the biblical story about Veronica taking pity on Jesus Christ on the road to Calvary, and upon wiping his sweating face with a cloth, the image of his features was miraculously transferred. The engraving achieves what was described in 1649 as a miracle of a different sort in a single line starting from the tip of Jesus' nose. Milan has engraved the entire face, the folded veil, and the lettering below. The modulations of direction, the thick to thin, model the, em the image in chiaroscuro. Chuck worked with Donald Farnsworth of Noya Editions to produce this print using a copy